Okay. Um, good evening, class. My name is Jeremy Liggins. I have my partner, Luis. And today we'll be talking about chapter six. And chapter six, it is titled Language, Barrier, and Bridge. Um, in the previous chapters, we've been understanding how communication, you know, how important communication is. And in this chapter, we'll be talking about how important language is and part of communication. Um, the first section in, in this chapter talks about how language is symbolic. And if you ask yourself, oh, why is language symbolic? Because going back to the beginning of the history of language, you can see um, how language has different symbols. And what I mean by symbols is like, um, like in the beginning of history, if you think about Egyptians with hieroglyphics, um, symbols have representations and like symbols, if you look at a certain symbol, they have a certain definition to that symbol. And um, the next section in this chapter highlights the understandings and misunderstandings of language. Um, in the textbook, it mentions that people have different conceptions of the same words. So for example, if you go to the barber shop and you ask the barber all oh, to only cut a little bit, in your mind, you might think a little bit is <laughs> what it actually means, a little bit, but the barber might believe what you're saying a little bit might actually be a lot. So it's a couple, you know, misconceptions, even though it's the same type of words. Also in this section, it points out semantic rules, which reflects on ways the user of language assign meanings to a particular linguistic symbol. For example, when you look at bikes, bikes are meant for um, riding. Or when you look, uh, think about food, you know, we obviously think food is for eating. Or when we look at books, books are meant for reading. That's when this rule, you know, comes into play. When we look at words and we know that it has like a, def like a definite meaning to it. Um, there is also equivocal language which is ambiguous language that has two or more equally plausible meanings. <clears throat> so for example, um, in basketball, when an announcer is saying that, oh, he's on fire, that doesn't literally mean that the guy is on fire. It means that, that you know, that certain individual is on a hot streak, but we think of fire as being hot, but it doesn't mean he's actually on fire. So that's when equivocal language come into um, play. There are also words known as relative words that gain their meaning by comparison. So if I say a person is fast as a cheetah or slow as a turtle, when we think of cheetahs, we think of them running fast. Or when we think of turtles, we think of them as slow moving, moving animals. So that's, you don't, we don't think of turtles as being fast and cheetahs as being slow. We automatically think of like when we think of a cheetah, all oh, one of his, you know, main strengths is, is speed. And the same thing for a turtle, like it's uh, one of his main things is that we know as a turtle is slow. Um, if I told you this sentence right here that Jeremy is a cool person the word is in that sentence can lead to a wrong assumption that people are consistent or something that won't change. This is known as statistic evaluation. The reason why is because even though with me, I can be a cool person, I can also be a funny person, a determined person, or maybe I can be a sad person. But just saying that Jeremy is a cool person it could mean that people might think, oh, he might be cool, but, you know, what are his other attributes? So that's when statistic evaluation come into play. Um, in this chapter, we're talking about language, and one language that we should look at is abstract language. And abstract language is um, language that is vulgar in general rather than concrete and suspicious. Uh, suspe uh, 
specific. So for example, if I say you need to have a better attitude, that's just saying in general, like if you have a better attitude, that means you'll you know become a better overall person. But it's speaking in general, if you can change your attitude, then you can become a better overall person in life. Um, you also have behavior language. And behavior language is language that describes a course behavior and also um, behavior that is observed over time. So for example, if I evaluated a person and I say, hey, I noticed that you're very happy in your new relationship. This is an example of behavior language because I've been watching a certain individual for, you know, a certain, you know, amount of time and have, you know, assumed that, OK, you're sad, you're happy, you know, um, depending on what situation you're going on in life. And the next concept to talk about is synthetic rules, which govern the grammar or language. <clears throat> so, for example, if we look at two forms of the same type of letter, and I ask you which letter is grammatically correct, that's an example of synthetic uh, rules, and where the meaning might be the same, but the grammar or the grammatic schemes in that letter or like what I'm saying it might be wrong so that's when you use synthetic language or synthetic rules um, another type of rule is um, pragmatic rules which is used to decide how to interpret messages in a given context in a textbook when you read in chapter 6 when it talks about um, pragmatic rules it's emphasized coordination which is really just to understand a person's point of view and to make sure you really like try to go into depth of what that person is communicating into you. Um, when it comes to the impact of language, conversions and diversions are important to understand because communication is commonly used when two or more people discuss a certain topic. And if a person decides to adapt to an individual's uh, style of speech, this is known as convergence and divergence would be speaking in a way that emphasizes their differences from others. So one example of probably convergence and divergence is one of the main topics put, you know, pertaining to this school is, you know, is the University of Memphis going back to on campus, you know, um, classes and conversions and diversions could play, you know, a good role because a person could have an opinion of saying, oh, yes, we probably need to go back to school. Um, another person can say, oh, it's probably best if we stick with online classes. And depending on how a person's, you know, um, point of view is, they could be you know, determined to listen to you or they could, you know, be, you know, eager to not listen to you because they um, are so confident in their perspective that they probably don't want to listen to you. You know, they just confident in their own opinion and believe that their opinion is the, you know, right direction to go. Um, the last language that I will be talking about is emotive language which is used to describe something, um, yeah, used to describe something, but it actually announces the speaker's attitude towards it. So some of the main topics that we've been um, looking or that we've seen on the news and things that have been going around the world is, um, of course, COVID-19 and also the Black Lives Matter movement. So the emotive language can play a key role or key concept because a person who's speaking on it can you know have emotions because that certain individual may have like a personal experience dealing with COVID-19 or you know the Black Lives Matter movement maybe they you know 
with COVID-19, maybe they actually, you know, have COVID-19 or maybe they lost someone due to COVID-19. The same thing with Black Lives, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. So, um, it's interesting, like, as far as, like, these different languages, it's very interesting to uh, look at. Then also, you have to um, understand that language, if you think about it, it's a very important factor in communication. Just like the way I'm communicating to the class, like I'm speaking in English. And also, um, if it wasn't for language, it would be very hard to communicate. And um, also with language, I learned that one of the main, you know, languages that are symbolic going back to the you know beginning of what i was saying with chapter six is sign language and we see sign language every day and people use you know hand gestures and different symbols to represent you know different words and different meanings and another thing that i learned um while reading the textbook is that um sign language I thought it was like one sign language, but I learned that it's also many other sign languages as far as like Chinese sign language, Spanish sign language. So it's different, um, multiple concepts when it comes to sign language. And um, as of right now, that's, um, I am done with um, part one when it come to chapter six and now i'll let my partner luis talk about part two of chapter six hi everyone my name is luis bolaños i will be doing part two um i just want to thank jeremy for doing part one he did really great on it um its statements replace the pronoun i what this does is take away the responsibility away from yourself and places it onto something else. This can be done consciously or unconsciously depending on the situation to avoid taking responsibility in, in, the, uh, in a specific scenario. For example, I could be saying, it's late for work or I am late for work. Instead of accepting the fact that it was my responsibility for being late, I am blaming time and placing the responsibility on something which I cannot control. A but statement that takes the form of X but Y automatically cancels what was previously stated during X. For example, I like your shirt, but I think you could have chosen a different color. The but statement in this case clearly suggests that you did not like the shirt in the first place, but were but decided to not be upfront about it and in a way not be rude so you dismiss the situation by saying, but I think you could have chosen a different color. Instead of being upfront about it, you chose to take a least offensive path. The way I see it, see this, it's when people say, no offense, but. And most of the times, what the person is about to say is clearly offensive. But they say, no offense, to kind of watch their back in a way. I, you, and we language. In the case of I language, as the previous slide shows, I takes responsibility for yourself. With you language, the responsibility is placed on the other person and implies that they were the ones doing something wrong and not yourself. For example, you are always late for dinner. The blame is placed on the other person and no responsibility is placed on yourself, meaning you believe you are the one that, that is in the right and the other person has done something wrong. So you don't take any responsibility. The responsibility is immediately taken away from you and placed into somebody else. I language takes responsibility for your actions but the text says that sometimes I language can make a person seem egotistic because I language makes everything about yourself. So it should be used under a moderate conversation to, to avoid making everything seem about yourself when you're talking to other people about a specific topic 
And in a way, by using I language all the time, you're making everything about yourself and neglecting what uh, uh, everyone else has to offer or say in the conversation. For example, I am always on time for dinner and you are not. You are taking responsibility for being on time, but also making the other person responsible for being late. This can also cause people to assume you are making everything about yourself because even though you are mentioning the other person, you are automatically saying that you were in time and blaming the other person for being late instead of giving them a chance to explain the situation to see if something may have happened along the way that caused them to be late. So eye language can be good, but you have to really monitor when you use it to avoid making everything about yourself that can potentially escalate the situation um, without it needing to go that way. To avoid using I language all the time, we language is a good strategy. To avoid making everything about yourself, we languages, we language can help um, both parties become responsible for whatever is being said in the situation or during a conversation. For example, we need to plan and make time for dinner. This makes both parties responsible for making time for dinner, but we language can also assume that both parties are on the same page when they are not. We language cannot replace I language, but it can be a, um, a good replacement for certain situations. But again, we language is also not always great to use because if you say we, you're automatically assuming that the other person is on the same track as you are or is thinking the same thing when they may be thinking something different and you're putting them in a situation where they... They have to agree something that they might necessarily not um, be 100% sure about. So, um, like, like I said previously, you just have to monitor how the situation is going before you use a certain type of language, uh, especially when it comes to I, you, and we language, because even though they can intertwine with each other and you can change them up, um, you just really have to monitor the situation to avoid escalating the situation or trying to make everything about yourself or automatically blame somebody else without understanding their reasonings first. Gender and language. Research suggests that men and women have very distinct ways in which they speak, but other research suggests that they may actually have more in common than we were initially led to believe and that those very small differences that they have between one another may not actually be as important as we initially thought. Studies suggest that people of opposite sex tend to talk about topics like movies, work, uh, television, but people of the same sex tend to talk about topics that are a little bit more personal like sex and sexuality. Those topics are usually reserved for people of the same sex to have those conversations. The studies suggest that women spend more time talking about domestic and personal sub, uh, subjects like relationship problems, family, health, reproductive matters, weight, food, and clothing. The same study shows that men spend more time talking about topics like music, sports, business, current events, and even other men. This is interesting because the stereotype is that women gossip more than men. But in reality, um, based on the study that is shown, uh, the studies shown in chapter six, um, men and women actually speak roughly around the same amount of words per day and when they gossip they gossip they gossip about usually the same topic matters but um it's just a stereotype that women speak more than men or that they may gossip uh more but in real in reality um they are roughly the same so th that stereotype is completely false Despite both men and women having distinct topics that they discuss or talk about, they also have quite a few that they have in common. For example, personal appearance, sex, dating advice, those kind of topics um, 
both men and women have in common with one another. So even though they may not speak about them to each other, they still have those same topics of conversation with people of the same sex. Because of these topics of conversation, sometimes it is hard for people to understand which topics are deemed more important than others because simply of the nature of which they of when they speak about them. So for example, if a couple is having dinner, a the male might say that talking about current events it's more important than having to talk about the relationship issues that they are having. But for a woman uh, who has those topics of conversation more often with people of her same sex, she may deem talking about the relationship more important than what is happening around the world or who is going to be on the next playoffs. So just because of those topics of conversation, sometimes it is hard to distinguish which are more important than others, where a female might see a family as more important and a man might see his work life as more important so those topics of conversation even though they are very distinct from one another each sex deems certain topics as more important and may not choose to want to discuss them uh, at a specific time or or feel like it's appropriate to talk about them because they don't they don't have they don't have the same um level of importance to them just because of the simple fact that they don't speak about them with they only speak about them within their own sex group and not other not outside of that because of these topics of conversation men and women may deem certain topics more important than others so for example let's say a couple is having dinner and the man wants to talk about what he deems as an important topic which is for example for him it may be what is currently happening in the world in this situation it may be a pandemic he wants to talk about in quotation marks that important topic but for the woman she may deem talking about the relationship issues that they are having as more important why this is because a man is more likely to talk about those topics with other men so he deems them as more important as where a female talks about with those same subjects with her uh female friends of the same sex so sometimes within um because of those different sex topics that they have um it is hard to distinguish distinguish within uh, a conversation which is more important than the other this doesn't necessarily mean that one is more important than the other they just think that because of the simple matter that that's what they talk about the most so for example a man may seem may think that those topics about the relationship aren't as important as what is happening in the in the world today but a woman may think that talking about those issues that they're having is more important and more immediate than talking about a pandemic that may soon be over with so just because of those levels of importance sometimes it is hard um when communicating with each other to to find a barrier and not neglect other people's or completely shut them down when they are trying to have a conversation because that's that's just simply rude. Gender and language. Reasons for communicating. The most common reason as to why people communicate is to get to know one another and make a, a topic of conversation more enjoyable for both parties. Having conversations helps build and make relationships as well as to maintain them. It also establishes a social connection with other people besides yourself. This is common for both men and women, but the way in which they go about achieving that goal is completely different. Um, it may not be 100%, but they both go about it in a different way. For example, men try to make a conversation more fun or joke around what people may typically call horseplay on the other hand women may try to make the conversation more personal or intimate to try to get a deeper understanding or relate or try to relate to the other person um when both are asked how did they like having that a conversation with a person of the same sex it may go something along these lines if you ask a man um, how he liked talking to another man, he might say that he liked the conversation. On the other hand, a woman might say that she needed to have that conversation with another female. 
So as where a man may have liked the conversation doesn't necessarily mean that he would want to talk to that person again. But a woman sometimes may feel that she needed to talk to somebody else within her same sex, perhaps to get a deeper understanding or try to relate to that other person and try to understand where the person was coming from or see if they could seek advice from them. That is why research shows that in married couples, a woman is most likely the one having or initiating conversations to maintain a relationship than a man is. Like we talked in the previous slide, a woman is more likely to initiate conversations about the relationship. For example, what are the issues that are happening in the relationship? It may be anger issues or it may be infidelity. There are a woman is more likely to initiate those topics and talk about them to try to resolve them than a man is. A man is less likely to initiate or start those topics of conversation unless a woman initially starts them. This may sometimes make a man seem that they are not as interested in the relationship or that they don't really care about it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't care. It's just they don't they are less likely to initiate those topics of conversation. So in return, uh, it makes it seem as, as if they don't care. But in reality, um, they do. They're just less likely to, to talk about it first. Gender and language conversation styles. Like I said previously, men and women speak roughly around the same amount of words per day. So no, women are not more talkative than men. Women tend to try to understand and relate to what the conversation is about. Men, on the, other, on the other hand, tend to have a more powerful language that may be more direct or to the point, usually task-oriented, and may not want to make that conversation a little bit more personal or try to relate to it like a woman would. Men, on the other hand, do not do that as much because they are not always because it's not always the most advantageous thing. Some people may see a person asking too many questions as nosy, but in actuality, it helps a woman be more persuasive than a man is. So by a woman making a conversation more personal or trying to understand them at a deeper level, she is able to better gauge a situation, and that actually helps a woman be more persuasive than a man. Um... So next time you're trying to have a, you're trying to persuade somebody, try to understand where they're coming from to use their own points to try to, 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 to get your own way through the, the situation instead of being the most powerful person in the, uh, in the conversation. Because it has been proven that even though a man has a more powerful or like stronger style of speaking, is not necessarily the best situation when trying to persuade somebody. So even though people may seem may think that women are nosy by uh trying to make conversations a little bit more personal or trying to get to know you by asking questions, in reality, um those type of things are good when you're trying to debate or have a persuasive argument with somebody. The topics of conversation that we just discussed are not necessarily just for face-to-face -face conversation. They also apply to an online format. So, for example, the same topics that you may have with the person of the same sex will most likely tend to come up during a online conversation or a conversation that may not necessarily be face-to-face. -face. So, like over the phone or during a group chat or a text message. So those same topics of conversation, even though um, they are better to talk about face to face, um, just remember that the same rules apply of not using I or you statements or we statements all the time. Try to gauge the situation to see which is better to use during a, during a conversation. Gender and language, non-gender variables. There are things that are not connected with being a man or being a woman. 
The text mentions how some careers may have men speak more with woman-like features or characteristics. For example, a daycare teacher. The text mentions how some careers may have certain men have more woman-like characteristics when it comes to speaking. So, for example, a male daycare teacher may have a more feminine approach of having conversations just because of the simple matter that that career involves a more personal way of understanding people that most men may not typically be used to. So those types of skills um, that would typically be associated with a woman speaker may may be optimal for that, that male teacher to have just because of their, their line of work. The gender role that the person plays also influences the way in which they speak because in some same-sex couples, the language changes despite being the same sex. So, for example, one of the partners may have a more masculine approach to conversation styles or way of speaking as where another one, as where the other may have a more feminine approach to starting a conversation. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person is feminine, just the way in which they initiate topics might be those that are typically associated with a woman or those associated with a man. It just depends on the gender role that, that they play um to society and themselves, that they may um choose to speak differently. Um, or just adapt to speaking that way because they feel more comfortable that better suits them. The way in which people communicate is not necessarily connected with biological sex, but rather the role they play in society and in their culture. So, for example, in the U.S., there might be a single dad and there might be a dad who has an entire family. There way that they will approach conversation will be very different from one another because a single dad has to play both roles to that child's life as where the the other the other dad may have a female partner or another male partner that may that may substitute the other role so uh just because they are both men doesn't mean that they are going to approach conversations or topics the same way it just is not tied to sex but more of what role that they play in society and the culture in which they are in because even uh if it's a man in the united states will be drastically different than a man who is from the middle east or asia culture and language verbal communication styles as we all know, things can be lost in translation and it has happened to the best of us, including big companies trying to introduce something to a different market. Translation is not necessarily the hardest part. The hardest part is trying to make sense of it for a different culture. As we all know, every culture is, is not the same and um, what may cause sense to your culture may not necessarily make sense to somebody from a different culture. Low context cultures value language as a way to express thoughts, feelings, and ideas as directly as possible. High context cultures, on the other hand, value using language as a mean of communication, communicating something through context. The United States falls under low context culture, meaning that most Americans prefer that you will tell them something directly as possible. Asian and Middle Eastern countries, on the other hand, use language in harmony as to call as to not cause the receiver and any harm or discomfort. What this does is makes the receiver analyze the the speech they are receiving in order to receive a message instead of being direct. Depending on the culture, different appro approaches may be taken to handle the situation because different cultures may have their own formal and informal language styles. Culture, language, language, and worldviews. Linguistic relativity. Worldviews of a culture is shaped differently depending on the culture and the people who speak it. 
bilingual speakers change the way that they speak when they switch between languages. I, for example, have caught myself doing this. When I speak Spanish, I feel less informal, more at home, something more relaxed. But when I speak English, it is something that I tend to talk about more formally. And just the conversations that I have in English are completely different than those that I have in Spanish. Different languages also have a very different way in which they communicate. For example, Romance languages tend to speak more smoothly or in a romantic tone than other languages. So just depending on what language that person speaks, the style and topic of conversations may also be completely different. The ones we have mentioned are that of American Eurocentric way of living or lifestyle. Sapir Whorf hypnosis suggests that language influences thoughts and not the other way around. If a language never developed something that they can't think about it because it was never in their vocabulary. So for example, let's say that in Mexico we never talked about astronomy or space. Just imagine. When I come to the U.S. and we talk about those things, I would be completely lost and would not be able to explain them to my parents because it just doesn't simply fit the vocabulary and may not necessarily be able to be translated in the same context. Language doesn't only affect the way we see the world, but also the way we reflect upon it. Different cultures see the world differently from birth to death just because of the simple topics of conversations or the vocabulary that they have. And that is simply okay. And as educated human beings, all we can do is try to understand different cultures and try to understand the world through their eyes. And language changes changes everything. The language we use has an impact on our mind, even in ways that we don't even notice. I just want to say thank you for everyone for sticking along in this chapter. I know I may not be the best speaker, but I try and I just want everyone to hopefully enjoy listening to this chapter.